Thank you. Uh, I am very conscious it is late and everybody's flagging. We're all hot, so we'll try and do this quickly. But it's exciting. It's interesting. Um, so I'm Phil Pollard. Um, I am the Sector Career Paths Manager, I think, these days, at Historic England. Um, I'm Jazz. I'm the Heritage Apprenticeships Advisor for Historic England. And also starring... Martin Lowcock from the University of Wales, Trinity St. David. Uh, we're going to do this as a bit of a trio, but Jazz and I will do a double act first. But we're here basically to talk about uh, apprenticeships and why you should consider apprenticeships. Uh, so to start off with, um, I was at the CIFA conference and I heard a very interesting paper by, by Kenneth. Um, and it was entitled, We Don't Have a Jobs Problem, We Have a Careers Problem. And in that paper, uh, Kenneth and uh, Chris Dorr noted unprecedented levels of hard-to-fill vacancies, this idea of the great resignation that's suddenly come. Um, there's no supply of European Union citizens and an inconsistency of graduate and non-graduate training programmes. We heard about a really great programme earlier. Um, but they noted in that, that paper the, the, the conflict between the need to sustain organisations in a private, sort of not-for-profit industry, and then the need to perpetuate professional values around mentoring, around growing young professionals, and then about repurposing business models. Now, we can't nece necessarily talk about all that now, but hopefully what we can do is encourage you to look at the idea of apprenticeships as one step on the road to tackle this. Um, so, as archaeology employers... We know that there's lots of you that would like to invest in your current workforce and aid retention and develop your existing staff. And there's also employers that would love to help support and develop the next generation of archaeologists and also to, to be able to provide qualifications. Um, and in addition, reduce the skill skills gaps and shortages that are existing within the sector. And as well, demonstrate to your clients that you can meet the social aims of your contract. And um, all of those things can be incorporated into an apprenticeship, so you might want to consider taking on an apprenticeship. So, the idea of work-based learning, which is effectively what an apprenticeship is, is it's nothing new. There's a long history of it in the sector. Um, for about 15 years, Historic England ran a specialist work-based learning programme called things like EPICS and HEPS. Uh, CIFA ran its work-based learning bursaries programme, the Skills for the Future had a, uh, from the Lottery had a whole bunch of programmes, and imagine there's people in this room who employed some of those uh, people, uh, or even were those placements themselves. So I say it's, it's not a new idea. Hmm. Here you go. So the apprenticeships are almost a new um, revolution. They're government backed and they're part of the education the formal system. Um, and they are able to combine work based learning with a qualification. So it's enabling someone to learn on the job as well as gaining their qualification. They're based on an apprenticeship standard which has been designed by the sector and for the sector. So it's been designed by people like you. And all the training costs are free and there's also additional incentives available as well. So that's what we want to get across really, that it, kind of the revolution is that this is now part of the formal education system. It's got the backing from the government. And it is that combination of the work-based learning that we are already good at and this achieving a qualification within the same structured framework. So, what exactly is an apprenticeship? So, an apprenticeship is a programme where the apprentice is basically learning on the job. They're earning money whilst they're experiencing the workplace, so it's gaining them the experience that they need whilst they're earning money and gaining the qualification. So it involves 20% on the job and 80% of the training and overall comprises at least 30 hours per week or part-time equivalents and lasts for more than 12 months onwards. And apprenticeships can be from levels two up to level seven. So that's equivalent to a GCSE at level two, going up to master's level or postgrad degree at level seven. And it, they're enabling employers to give the opportunity to new staff but also to existing employees. Um, degree apprenticeships offer the opportunity for someone to study for a degree for free, making many roles in the sector more accessible to a wider audience. And they're available to all employers in the historic environment sector. OK, so that's what an apprenticeship is, if you didn't know. Hopefully you've got a better idea. Um, just to give a bit of background, since about 2017, 
Um, Historic England has chaired something called the Historic Environment Trailblazer, which is a group of over 70 uh, sector employers, training providers, professional bodies, and they've worked together to develop a bunch of new apprenticeship standards uh, in the areas of archaeology, also in conservation, historic environment advice, and now also in heritage construction. And we work with the Institute for Apprenticeships, and they're the, they're the sort of the government body who determine whether you can actually have that as an apprenticeship standard or not. Um, each of those groups were broken down. Uh, each of those areas were broken down into working groups, um, so that they were clearly representing the, the, the sector and the employers um, that they were developing standards for. And all the working groups had a chair, and that feed, fed into an overall steering group. But the, the point is that we were actually doing this in collaboration across the sector but also then focusing on our kind of discipline areas as well. Um, and the key thing is it's developed by the sector, for the sector, so it's not coming from, from elsewhere. Um, what do we end up with then? Well, this is the list. I think it's currently accurate. I don't know if you can read it. Um, but there are six standards that are now available to use for apprenticeships. And I've got on the table there uh, where the training providers are and how many people have started. And so to clarify that point, to have an apprenticeship, you need two things. You need an employer to offer the person the job, that on-the-job development, how they do the job, and you need a training provider to deliver that taught element. Um, and the ones that you guys are most probably interested in are the Level 3 Archaeological Technician and the Level 7 Archaeological Specialist. Um, and there's already been some, some trailblazing organisations that have started using these. And uh, obviously, we've got Martin here, who's going to tell us the practical example of how the Level 7 Archaeological Specialist has been running. Um, so, University of Wales, Trinity at David, is delivering the tour element of that. Um, and the likes of uh, LP, Archaeology, Waldo Armstrong, Div Ventures, MSDS Marine have all started on that. The level three, I'm just going to name check people, Albion, Cotswold and Wessex have all got people started on that. So if you don't want to be left behind, you best get back on it quick. Um, but yes, what's the cost then? So obviously there is cost to consider. The payroll costs for the apprentice is decided by each organisation. So his dog England, we're paying our apprentices at least the living wage, but it is up to each organisation how much you pay your apprentice. Um, there's also the eligibility to not pay national insurance contributions for apprentices under the age of 25. And there's other incentives such as a one-off £1,000 payment available to the employer when they train a 16 to 18 year old, or if you train a 19 to 24 year old who's previously been in care or has a local authority education health and care plan. So there are incentives out there to enable you to financially afford it. Um, in terms of the actual training costs, so if your organisation has pays towards the annual pay bill more than three million pounds, 95% of your training costs will come from the apprenticeship levy. Um, and then the government will pay the additional remaining 5% to the training provider. So the cost will actually be nothing to you as an organisation, apart from the payroll cost. But however, if you're a smaller organisation and you don't pay the £3 million annual pay bill, 95% of the training will still come from the levy pot, from the um, underspends. So you would just have to pay 5% of the training. So with the Level 7 Archaeology um, specialist program that's fifteen thousand pounds that means you'd be paying seven hundred and fifty pounds towards the training so seven hundred and fifty pounds to put someone through a master's course i think is is a pretty good deal for everybody all round really so to sum up why we think you should employ an apprentice um for these reasons um there's a there's a mix of things here it's this ability to both upskill or side skill existing staff with, within a recognised structured framework um, that meets the standards that you know, developed and designed by the, by the sector. Um, you also get them a qualification, and it's at minimal cost to everybody involved. To you, there's minimal cost in terms of that training because most of it's paid by the government. To the individual, there's no cost. Uh, and if I was a young person looking at what my career options were, and someone says, well, go and do this master's course, it'll cost you, you know, 1500 2,000, 8,000, whatever, or go and do an apprenticeship, it'll cost you nothing and you can learn on the job. I'm going to want to do the apprenticeship. Um, you also 
as was mentioned a couple of times earlier today, contracts clients are wanting to see this kind of social impact and how you can do it and taking on apprenticeships can really demonstrate how you are how you are doing that. So a current apprentice who is working for Historic England on the Historic Environment Advice Assistant Level 4 programme, um, he has basically really recommends the programme. Um, he says it's good for someone who doesn't know much about the sector, but they want to know more. And it's been really valuable for helping him understand what his place could be in the, in the future for that career. I didn't press the button. There he is. <laughs> Um, so, before we hand over to Martin to talk about this in practice, what next? Uh, well, you'll find out from Martin in a minute how the Level 7 is going and what that can do for you. Um, we have some leaflets somewhere on the table there. If you take them, there's a lovely QR code you can scan, and there's a whole document that tells you all this information. Uh, it's really easy. Thank you, my glamorous assistant. Um, but if you do want any more advice, you can contact myself and Jazz, um, Heritage of Apprenticeships at historicengland.org.uk. Um, there are a couple of questions I'll prompt with, and then we can talk to them after Martin. I'm really interested on, on thoughts from people on the difference between the apprenticeships and the type of scheme that MOLA are doing. Um, what are the issues there? What about if you don't have the capacity like an organisation like MOLA? You aren't a big organisation with a lot of resource. How would you do something similar, and would apprenticeships work better for you? Um, questions about contracts are always an interesting one. The apprenticeship requires you to give that person a contract for the length of time of the apprenticeship. That's usually a minimum of 12 months. In the case of level seven, it's um, much longer, as Martin will say. Um, and then there's issues about eligibility worth talking about as well. If you're an archaeology university graduate, you can't do a level three apprenticeship because it's lower than the qualification you've got in that subject. But you can easily do a level seven. So they're the kind of things I'm really interested in finding out about from employers. Um, these have been around for a while, and there are people on them, but the numbers are really small, and I'm, I'm really interested why the numbers are so small. So I'm going to hand over to Martin, who's going to tell us about the Level 7. Thank you. Right. Thanks. Yeah, I'm from University of Wales, Trinity St. David, as my shirt proudly proclaims, and... Uh, Despite 10 years of brand building, uh, it'll make, probably make life easier if I say I'm from Lampeter, <laughs> uh, which has a very long uh, tradition in, in uh, delivering uh, archaeological programs, um, but as I say, it's now called Trinity St. David. Um, and uh, so, yeah, as, as, uh, as has been said, this, this, uh, we were actually involved in the Trailblazer group that was setting up this program, um, involved in the discussions with CIFA and the, the employers about what, what needed to go into it to make it relevance to the, to the, uh, to, to the employment, employer needs. Um, uh, and we've been delivering it since, uh, since September uh, with our, our first cohort. Look, I'm sure I, yeah, I see there's a typo there. Um, I, 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 I've never been able to type archaeologist. <laughs> uh, I, I, I actually set up a macro uh, uh, when I was doing archaeology full time uh, to, to correct that because I, every time I type it, I get it wrong. Um, so, yes, yeah, so as I say, it's been driven by employer needs that, that identified skill gaps. And I was looking at the, uh, the State of the Industry report that just came out for, from FAMES a couple of days ago. Um, it's an updated version of this. Um, this, is the, this is last year's version, <laughs> or the previous version. Um, uh, archaeological employers are always faced with skill gaps. There's constraints on what, what employers can do in terms of their business uh, because of the lack of availability of skills. Um, and so these figures come and go. It's quite, I was trying to look for a pattern there, and I couldn't really see one. Um, but I think there are some skilled gaps which can be perhaps dealt with in a relatively short term, uh, like lack of, lack of um, new, new entry into field work. Um, yes, that's an issue, but potentially fixable in the short term. There's other, other, other skill gaps which don't go away. And particularly, I, th I think that we, what we would, we would focus on is the area around how you train project officers and project managers, how you get people to get, take on that level of responsibility where they become uh, sound professional judges of what needs to happen. Um, that's the tricky bit, you know, and it's very difficult for organisations to teach that. Um, and this programme addresses that, that particular point in, in people's careers. 
So what do employers complain about? So this is this, um, uh, certainly part of the, what was driving the, the, the need for this, this program was the fact that there are specialists retiring and not being replaced. So what, what do we do? We've got material that needs, that needs to be analysed, but no one to analyse it. Um, shortages in, in, in particular key areas, um, uh, you know, there, there, there are particular topics uh, where there, there, is, there is either nobody or not enough people around are doing work. And there's a whole issue in terms of the, the old style of organising specialist work, which is very much bringing in, outsourcing it, bringing in um, university researchers or whatever to do pieces of work um, with, within the context of a, a commercial project. Uh, and there's all sorts of issues there around communication, priorities, um, availability. Um, basically, it makes my life much easier if you have your specialists in-house. Um, they're much more controllable. <laughs> That's for that lightly, uh, politely. Um, issues with long lead times, that, that basically if, if, if you've got specialists who've got time, their, their work is booked out for the next few years, then that means you can't complete your project until, until your turn comes in the queue. Lack of flexibility, inconsistent methods and reporting, and again, this is an issue that's been, been, been highlighted by CIFA and others. The fact that um, the, the, the sort of reports you get from a specialist um, will depend who they are. Um, which doesn't really promote sort of uh, the sharing and, and uh, sort of uh, bringing together of data. Uh, and yes, yeah, sort of fundamentally, again, we talked about the issue about archiving, and, and th th there's a lot of projects in progress sitting on shelves. And they're sitting on shelves, or they might be sitting on shelves, because the specialists haven't finished the report, and therefore the project isn't complete. So there's, there is a real financial cost um, that that's, you know, is, is driving the, the employers. Okay, so, so what, what, what this, this, this standard um, consists of, so it's aimed at people in early mid-career, they're becoming responsible for data analysis and reporting. And we're using the word specialist in a very broad sense. I'm, we started off, I think, it's fair to say, with the idea of a fine specialist. That's what it's about. How do we train new fine specialists? But we've actually broadened it out, so it does cover things like project management. So, um, so we have uh, apprentices who are um, project officers doing commercial projects um, and they're taking on you know, their specialism is the project management. Uh, it can be new employees, but with a, we see this as being particularly valuable for existing members of staff who you want to upskill or promote. And the, what the, the, the standard consists of is a master's program and then doing a work-based project as well and then a port portfolio demonstrating the KSBs, the knowledge, skills and behaviours to basically to show that they're competent uh, to, to perform all those tasks. Uh, this is, these are the KSBs, and I won't read them all out to you. <laughs> um, but, for example, the top one says, how to recognize and understand archaeological data, site types, periods, artifacts, and ecofacts, and site formation processes. Um, so that's quite a big chunk. If you can do that at master's level, then you're doing quite well. Um, that, that, um, and these are the skills and these are the behaviours. So there's, there's a lot of things. So someone who gets to the end of the programme will have to have demonstrated that they've actually done all of this in their work. So um, as, as has been mentioned about sort of prior experience, if somebody already knows all these things, then they won't learn anything new from the apprenticeship. And we're not allowed. We have to do an initial assessment to work out how much people already know so we don't teach them stuff that they, they, they've already got on board. But what we focused on in terms of our teaching is looking at the things which are hard to learn in the field or, or in the office. Um, from the course of your day-to-day -day work, there are things you can learn with your hands, getting your hands dirty. There's things which are harder to, particularly around sort of uh, uh, about theory and how that might apply to your practice, um, and particularly high-level public pu pu publication. If you're, con if you're continually producing grey literature reports, you'll get very good at that. But if you're then asked to produce a peer-reviewed peer publication, you will have no, have no opportunity to engage with what that actually entails. Okay, so what, what we did at Trinity St. David, um, we've got master, masters are covered by a, a, a characteristic statement, and that's effectively our specification. Because it has to be, a, so masters, it has to in, include this. Um, so what we did is we redesigned our existing MA to address the KSB specifically. Um, and uh, we, we mentioned before about uh, teaching adults, uh, there's this andragogy, the process of teaching adults rather than children. 
Adults need to know the relevance of what they're taught um, because otherwise they won't pay much attention. And one of the key things we're trying to focus on is the development of criticality. When people are not taking, taking what a source says as read, they're thinking about that, they're analysing the value of that source, the reliability of that source, and therefore the extent to which you should, you should trust its judgement. And what we've identified, because obviously we've got lots of different specialists, so there are common features to specialist practice, um, in particular the project life cycle. All projects go through a life cycle, and that our course is based on that. So what we've done is we've divided up the project life cycle into, um, into, into modules. So we start off with research methods and project planning and delivery, project reporting, specialist practice, whatever the specialism is, and then doing a dissertation as well. So that's a three-year program. Uh, and if, if, if we, as part of the, there's a, a requirement, one of the eligibility requirements is that the employer has to release someone for 20% of their working hours in order to undertake their study. So it works out one day a week. Um, we're, actually, we are, we're actually delivering it, Wednesday is our teaching day. Um, half of it is spent in terms of um, uh, online Zoom meetings, and the other half is independent study. Uh, wherever possible, we've integrated real life studies. So for example, um, they just finished an assessment where they had to prepare a more project proposal. Um, that was the test, if you like. That's what we taught them to do. Um, so that, that they, they were using their own work experience as an exa example to create, to create a document. And uh, one of the aspects we've in included, because people have too much Zoom, is a lot of interaction. So we've presented people with realistic professional scenarios, like how you put together a WSI, how you decide which sites are important, which sites to be preserved within a development, which sites you're going to investigate, which sites you're going to ignore, um, and discuss and justify those choices. Okay, and the first, the first cohort's up and running. Um, these are our employers, you know, as, as, as mentioned. Um, the specialisms, as I say, the mixture of project management, post X, and looking at medieval pottery. And the feedback we've had from the employers um, uh, is that there are issues. Releasing someone one day a week um, can make life difficult when you're trying to timetable people's work. Uh, we've had some people coming in remotely from a car on site um, for, their, for their training session, um, or some people having to catch up on the, on the recording because they weren't able to do it live. So there are some issues there, and there's no, no way of avoiding that. Um, it's been very helpful in terms of the, 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 the reflection on practice that the, that the apprentices have reported that they've, they've started to think about why they're doing things, not just how, which again came up with the, with the MOLA presentation. Um, They've reported they're much more confident in their work. They feel like they know what they're doing. They're doing better work as well. In terms of, and they've also found the real-life scenarios very useful because we try and cover a broad range of activities, not just the one particular bit that they're doing from day to day. And so we've actually had some, some specific quotes, which uh, uh, I, will, I, will, I will read because I think you know, this really gets to the number of it a greater understanding of archaeological practice in the real world, details on ethical practice, we, with a big emphasis on ethical practice and how people, you know, what's doing the right thing actually means in difficult situations where there is no right, right answer. You know, really, what do you do when you suddenly find a mosaic on site? Um, you know, you know what, 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 what can you, what should you do? Uh, range of method software within the commercial sector. Archaeological theory is not as irrelevant as I once thought. <laughs> Well, it's quite interesting because uh, certainly we've, we've tied a lot of the um, looking, at, looking at archaeological theory in terms of um, public benefit um, and then sort of linking that to things like Black Lives Matter to say, well, actually, you know, that the, the, the social role of archaeology is important to individual projects as well as um, to the broader discipline. A love for archiving and metadata, whereas I could be, before I could barely describe it. I mean, that's a real win, that this is somebody who is now specialising in, 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 in archiving um, with, it, with her role within the company. Uh, engaging with other professionals in the same stage of their career is eye-opening. Eye again, we've got a range of different people doing different things. So, uh, what's going to happen next? Well, that, those, those, that cohort's going to move on. Uh, project reporting is the next, next module. We'll be starting that in the autumn. And we've got a new cohort starting in October this year. 
um, if I have enough employers on board. And I'm hoping that some of you today uh, will, will, will uh, get in touch with me um, and we, we may be able to finalize, identify some people it might be, be suitable for. Uh, thank you very much.